the ushers are going to come forward. We'll pass the elements, and when you receive the bread and the juice, hold on to it through this next song, and afterwards, we'll take it together. Ushers, come on forward, and let's begin to pass the elements. Let's continue to worship.
Jesus sat down in heaven with all of his disciples. And he took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Eat of this bread and remember me. Let's eat the bread together.
kingdom. Amen. 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 And this week we will be praying for Tyler Johnson with Redemption Church. Pastor Tyler has a heart, a passion for the mental health. And he has a church that is a trauma-informed church. What's great is they have nine congregations throughout the state of Arizona. Each one of their communities is different. And they serve each of those communities in a very unique way. Please join me as we lift him and his family up. Father, thank you so much for Pastor Tyler. We thank you, Lord, for all of the congregations, all of those that call Redemption Church home. We ask, Father, during this week that you will give them rest, give them energy, give them your joy for the upcoming Easter services. And Lord, we thank you for Haley and his family and his um, four children. We ask that you bless them, unify them, Lord, as one family. We thank you for the pastors, Lord, that are across the nine congregations. Fill them up. Protect them as they serve you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to invite the ushers to come forward receive today's tithes and offerings. In your seat backs, you have this, uh, this green salvation prayer card. Would everybody please take one of these out? Should we seat, reach in the seat back in front of you take one of these out? Everybody hold it up. Friends, next week is Easter. This right here is why we do Easter. It's not so we can pack out the room and see how many people we can get through these doors. It's to invite people to meet Jesus. That's why we do what we do. Because of the saving hope of Jesus. Because we have this love, we have this peace, we have this joy, and we want to share it with others. And so on this card, write down the names of people you are praying for who need to know the love of Jesus. Who are you bringing this Easter? Do not come alone. Who are you inviting to come with you? We have seven opportunities for you to invite someone to this, this Easter next weekend. Two on Saturday night, four on Sunday morning at the Glendale campus right here, and one bright and early sunrise service at the new Peoria campus. Yes! I'm, I'm stoked with this. A, a, a completely different uh, sunrise service experience. It's going to be amazing. ASL will be offered at every single one of the services. Who are you bringing? Who are you inviting? This is why we do what we do. Amen? Amen. And throughout the year, we go and we serve our community. But during Easter services, our community walks through our doors. So we need you to invest. We need you to invest in creating an environment where everyone, no matter their background, no matter their experience, feels welcomed, and that this is a safe place so they can meet Jesus, right? Amen. Just say amen. amen. So we need you. We need you to serve. There is a volunteer sheet inside your bulletin. I want you to pull that out. I want you to sit there and really look at the service times. Pick one service and one area of ministry to serve in. Family, why do we invest our time? Well, one, God calls us to, right? He calls us to serve his kingdom. And two, it's about his people. I'm going to share a story with you about Christine. Christine was invited by a friend. A friend that God gave the boldness to that to invite her to service. When she first came through the doors, she, it was just awkward to her. But she felt that she was supposed to be here. Why? Because she felt love. And then God called her to be baptized. Yeah. And I want you to see... Look at that face, family. Look at that. Yeah. This is why we invest and we serve here inside this church. It's so people like Christine, when they walk through the doors, we're going to have hundreds of Christines coming through our doors yeah. this Easter service. Yeah. We need you to be a part of the reason why well, they come and they yeah. say yes to Jesus. Good. Good. It is about inviting and it is about investing. Be part of of an eternal reason, right? We're here to give God the glory. And if you have not been water baptized, we have baptisms every single service at Easter, so sign up to be part of that so you can have a story just like Christine's. Would you pray with me? Father God, everything that we do here is for your glory. It's not to pat ourselves on the, on the back of getting a spotlight, God. It is to put you smack to have in the center of the spotlight and shine all the lights on you, God. We love what you are doing in us and through us. We love what you are doing in this city, God. And we say, God, would you, would you let us be a part of it? 
can we come to? Can we be a part of what we are doing? God, let, uh, r- remind us of the names that we need to write down. Remind us of the people that we need to invite. Remind us of the people who need to be here to hear the story of how much you love them. We love you, God. Would you use these tithes and offerings for your kingdom and for your glory? In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Welcome to Pure Heart Church, a place where you're encouraged to come authentically as you are, experience healing and growth, and discover meaning and purpose through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We connect with God through worship, salvation, baptism, and communion. We want to help you grow with others in the family of God through personal, relational, and intentional discipleship. This happens through discipleship coaching, life groups, and support ministry. We are a community that values transparency, vulnerability, and relationships. In our shared connection and love for Christ, we go out to the greater community and the world to make real change. We have a passion for the transformation of individuals and communities, locally and globally. Join us in the adventure and be a part of the exciting things God is doing through Pure Heart Outreach. At Pure Heart, we desire to see children and students develop lifelong faith through connecting in small groups, partnering with parents, and giving opportunities to serve others. Volunteers are an integral part of the Pure Heart family. There are so many opportunities available here to use your gifts and talents to bless others and be a vital part of the ministries across our campus. To get plugged in, you can sign up online or get more information in the lobby. Family, how are we doing today? All right. Uh, So, hey, on Mother's Day, which is in a few weeks, Mother's Day uh, weekend, we are having family dedications. Family dedication is an opportunity for a family to stand up here on the platform, and they dedicate their child or children to the Lord. They dedicate their house, their home, their marriage, their relationships to the Lord. And we, as the body of Christ, we dedicate ourselves to the Lord as well and dedicate to walking alongside them because... Uh, There's no such thing as other people's kids in the kingdom of God. So, um, husbands, pro tip, lean in. Um, Lean over to your wife right now and say, hey, do you want to get our family dedicated for Mother's Day? Don't let it be her idea. Like, this will, I'm helping you win. I got you. Okay, go. (laughs) Good morning, everybody. Hey, I want to just plant a seed. We've got some exciting things happening at Pure Heart. And this fall, we are going to be launching here at our Pure Heart campus in Glendale, Heart College. Woo! We are very excited about this. Now, what you say, what, what's this all about? Well, the, uh, the goal and the vision of this is to combine the practicality of a ministry training school with the uh, discipline of being able to get an accredited academic degree. We have partnered with Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida to be able to offer an accredited degree to our students in three different areas, but this is specifically targeted for those students who believe that God is calling them into ministry. So for this first year, we're looking at 18 to 25 year olds. So if you have an 18 to 25 year old student in your home, maybe somebody's getting ready to graduate from high school, God is moving on their heart, please talk to us about Heart College. The info desk has got some resources there. There's a card like this that we can get you some info. Also, there's a landing page on our website that you can go to, but we'll be rolling more of this out after Easter. Just wanted to plant a seed for you today. Heart College, coming fall of 2019. And this Thursday is team night. Who's excited about team night? Team night, it is a blast. If you are volunteering for Easter, you need to be a team night. If you are volunteering anywhere, you need to be a team night. If you're not yet volunteering or serving somewhere, you need to be a part of team night. We worship together, it's amazing. Uh, we hear vision from Pastor Dan, and then we break out into our, our team huddles, and we become a more equipped and, and connect with each other relationally, get to know each other better. You do not want to miss team night this Thursday, every third Thursday at 6.30 p.m. right here. Family, have great service.
everybody doing today? You doing good? Great to see you. Welcome everybody online. Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys. Give them a big hand as well. So a couple weeks ago, I told you I was going to be down here on the floor talking with you because we're in this together to meet the great need of our city, which is a relationship with Christ and a relationship with one another. Uh, today is not really going to be a sermon, as you may know, a sermon. I want to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation as we land this series about our mission as a church right here on this campus. Not just what we're doing in the community. We talk a lot about that, but what are we doing right here on our campus? And why do we do some of the things that we do? And why do we say some of the things that we say? Like, why do we invest so heavily in mental health and trauma and addiction? Why do we have people on our staff that most 99.9% .9 of churches wouldn't hire for that position? And why do we say things like, it's okay to not be okay, but it's absolutely not okay to pretend, and you don't have to stay stuck. Yes? yes. Why do we say these things? Why do we do these things? We're going to talk about that for a little bit as we land this series today. I believe that each and every one of us, as we live long enough... We all have a deep need in our soul. Healing from trauma. Say that with me. Healing from trauma. Say it one more time. Healing from trauma. No one gets through this life without facing some pain. Uh, my, my friend, Pastor Sang Hung Yu, he always says this. He says, we're all m &Ms. He says, we're all messed up and mixed up. But we're sweet on the inside. Although some of us are nuts. So that's just a, just a little thing to share right there. But still sweet. But still sweet. Okay. And this is why we are a trauma-informed church, that we daily are growing in our ability to impact the greatest need of our city, the healing of brokenness. In your bulletins, you will see this trifold. Go ahead and take that out right now. We share this every year at our Resilient Church Conference. So we gather churches and, and groups from all over the city who need to be equipped on how to be a trauma-informed church to meet this great need of our city of issues of brokenness. It's Brokenness, because churches aren't prepared to deal with what's really happening in our city with mental health issues. Can I get a mm hmm from anybody today? We are still growing ourselves, understanding this impact that it has on the mind, on the body, and on the soul. And so this trifle is what we give churches that come. I think they had almost 300 people this year at our Resilient Church Conference. We give this to them to say, are you a trauma-informed church? Do you understand what it means to truly be a welcoming, safe place for people who are hurting and broken to attend, find Jesus, and find healing, to go out to help other people who are hurting and broken, to find Jesus, to find healing, who go out and help other people who are hurting and broken, turn to your neighbor and say, I get it, stop, okay, just, I understand where you're going, all right? So we have Pure Heart, we have discovered a powerful insight for the healing of trauma in its deep relationship. Relationship with Christ, most importantly, supremely, and relationship with with one another. So we've been taking kind of a three-part look at the theology of relationship and how it impacts trauma. All the experts agree across all fields and perspectives. They all agree. They know that the number one universal greatest way to heal from brokenness, to heal from trauma, is consistent love over time by at least one person. Say that with me. Consistent love over time by at least one person. We have come to know him here at Pure Heart as Jesus. Amen? Last week, we talked about the fact that then Jesus invites us to be an extension of his consistent love over time through more than one person. Our great need, relationship with Jesus, relationship with one another. So, we've got that all laid deep in our hearts. We've been talking about that now. This is our third week in a row. Who here today, just by a show of hands, has not been able to be here the last two weeks? Who here is your first time in this series? Just raise your hand real quick. All right, all right, so several of you. That's good. That's why I took some time to make sure you had a foundation of where we were going. So open your Bibles with me. Open your Bible apps. So pull out your bulletin notes. The scriptures are there. If you don't have any of those three things, look at the screen, okay? We want you to see God's word today. And so Psalms chapter 34 is where we're going to anchor for just a few moments. Psalms chapter 34. Let me tell you a little bit about Psalms chapter 34. David, um, the Psalms, many of the Psalms were written by a man named David who was the greatest king of Israel. And these psalms are kind of, if you can put it this way, I hope you don't get offended by this. These would be basically David's, this is David's journal, if you will. David was journaling about his life experiences. And then David took his journal and he put it to music. And the nation of Israel would worship to these, to these thoughts, to these insights that David had about God and relationships with others. You could say this is or David's jams, if you will, all right? If you would like to say that. You probably wouldn't hear it first service, I understand. I'll just, Move on and save that for second, third service. Okay. So David writes down these thoughts 
He puts it to music. The nation of Israel worships to these insights, these perspectives about God and relationships with other people. Now, what you need to know about David is David faced truckloads of trauma. There were constant attempts on his life, even from when he was a small child tending his father's sheep. There's this moment when he goes to face Goliath. You remember the story of David and Goliath? Anybody? Anybody have a Bible? Okay, I'm just checking, all right? I just want to make sure, okay? So David goes and he, he faces Goliath. But do you remember what David said to Saul before he faces the Goliath? Saul's like, you're just a boy. How can you do this? And David, I don't know what it looked like. He kind of maybe puffed his chest out and says, your servant has faced both the lion and the bear. And I have killed them with my very own hands. This Philistine will be nothing for me. And you just kind of go, giddy up. All right, that's just some intense moments right there. But we look at that and we read that. And you know, how many of you grew up going to Sunday school? You know, in Sunday school, we hear these stories, and you look at that, and David killed the lion and the bear with his bear with his hands, you know, and you're just like, that's amazing. Can you imagine the trauma of being attacked by a bear? I mean, we kind of look at this antiseptically, right? It's like, oh, yes, he grabbed him by the hair, stabbed him with a knife, and everything was fine. Or a flintstone, okay? He just, he just killed him, okay? No, you get attacked by a bear and a lion, it's going to do something to you. Matter of fact, in Psalms 23, when David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What happened in ancient times is when a shepherd was attacked and God showed up and, get and rescued them, they would make a notch on the staff. And the notch represented every time God came through for them. When David said that, he looked down and I'm sure he saw a notch that said, lion and bear. Oh my. <laughs> one person in the room got that. First service, I need you. You got to join me today. Don't make me make you stand and greet seven times to wake you up. Okay, come on. David faced all this trauma. Now, this psalm was written in response to a moment that David had with a king who wanted to take his life. David was afraid for his life. Fear had gripped him. He was so afraid that David pretended to be insane. To be mentally ill. So insane, if you read the story, that, the, that he caused drool to drip down his beard. And he flailed about wildly. And the king looked at David and said to his servants, Hey, this guy is nuts. Get him out away from me. I'm not wasting my time. And David was able to escape. And so in this, another, another moment of trauma for David. Another moment of brokenness and fear. David sits down and reflects on his relationship with God. And it reflects on his relationship with others. And in Psalms 34, we find one of the most beautiful psalms in the Old Testament. And here's what David writes, verse 1, chapter 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. This word extol means to rave and to celebrate. He's like, I will celebrate God at all times. Whether lion, bear, and angry king going to take my life, I will celebrate, I will celebrate, I will celebrate at all times. His praises will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. And then he says this, let the afflicted, everybody say afflicted. <laughs> afflicted here in the Hebrew language means the depressed. Let the oppressed, let the depressed, let those who are broken and hurting, let them hear, let them hear what I've gone through, let them hear my story, and let them rejoice with my God. Then David goes on and he writes this. Now he gets into community, relationship with one another. And this is what he says. He says, oh, glorify the Lord with me. This idea of with me means come near me. Come near me and let's glorify God together. I don't want to just celebrate about Jesus by myself. I want to celebrate Jesus with you. Corporately. Come, let's glorify the Lord with me. Let's exalt. Let's rave about his name together. And everybody said, Amen. skip down verse 6, it goes on, says this, David writes, this poor man, this idea of poor man means afflicted again, or depressed, this afflicted and depressed man, I cried out, I called out to the Lord, and he heard my cry, the word he heard here means to pay attention, how many of you have ever had a moment in your life where you wonder, God, do you even see what I'm going through, anybody? Okay. Nobody? That's six of you. All right. That's good. Your lives are amazing. That's awesome. That's good stuff. He heard my cry. He paid attention to my cry. And he rescued me. He saved me. The word saved me means this. It's so good. He saved me. The word in the Hebrew means to snatch away. 
Have you ever had a moment in your life where you were going through a difficult time and you were so overwhelmed that all of a sudden, intern, internally, you just felt God's presence snatch you out of that depression and bring you joy that you never knew you could experience? Uh -huh. Anybody? All right, how many of you have ever been in a circumstance that you were overwhelmed, you didn't know how it was going to come through, maybe it's financial, maybe it's relational, maybe it's a health situation, and all of a sudden, at just God's time, it's always God's time, right? It's not always our time, because our time would have been much earlier than God's time. <laughs> come on, can we testify about that today? I feel like, Lord, if you could have come two years earlier on this one, all right, or two weeks, or two hours, or two minutes, okay? But it's just God's right time. He snatches you out of that situation, gives you everything that you need, not always everything that you want. And he provides for us. And David says that he snatched me out of my depression. He snatched me out of my affliction. And he rescued me at just his right time. And this next part says in verse 7. He says this. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. The word encamps here means to pitch a tent or to make your home. That God's angel armies come and make their home with us, especially those who fear God, who reverence God, who honor God, who walk with God, who draw near to God. He encamps around them. There, there's this, this great song that we sing, This Is How I Fight My Battles. You like that song? Yeah. This is how I fight my battles. We just do that over and over and over again. Uh -huh. and this is how I fight my battles. My favorite line in the song is this. You may think that I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by... Ah, that's good, isn't it? I'm going to stop singing for you right now. <laughs> you know, something like, well, I just sit for the worship team, Pastor Dan? No, no, I'm just excited this morning, okay? And David said, here's what I discovered in my trouble. Here's what I discovered in my depression. Here's what I discovered in my insanity. That because of my reverence for God, because I drew near to him, he sent his angel armies to draw near to me surrounds me. He says, and I knew the presence of God. I knew his power. And I experienced the fact that I was not alone in my trouble. And everybody said, Amen. The next part I'm going to read to you uh, is my favorite part of all of this song. It's kind of a due north statement for us as a church family. It's really why we do what we do. It's really our catalyst, our, our, our anchor, if you will, as a church family. And so before I get to that, I want to give you an opportunity to meet those around you and uh, get some oxygen in your brains and get your mind reset. Let's stand all across the room. Greet 18 and a half people. <laughs> so I just want to say you are I can feel your energy all the way down here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So David, uh, let's get down to verse 18. This next statement that caught my attention in Psalms 34, I believe is just, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful, powerful moment. We could spend hours just trying to unpack this statement. But I have 16 minutes. <laughs> David says in verse 18, the Lord is close. Somebody say close. close. The Lord is cro close to who? <laughs> the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. This, this idea of brokenhearted means to burst. Have you ever been in a circumstance, a situation, where you felt like your life burst? Yeah. And everything just blue up. And David said, here's what I discovered in my fear. Here's what I discovered in my trauma. Here's what I discovered when it seemed like my life was over and everything just blew up around me. I discovered that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. How many of you have ever heard of a man named Henry Blackaby? Henry Blackaby wrote an amazing book years ago called Experiencing God. In Blackaby's book, he had a very, very simple approach to loving Jesus and following God closely. 
And he simply said this. He said, all we need to do is begin to look around and see where God is moving. And then join him there. Yeah. Let me just say something to you, church, very, very clearly this morning. God is always moving towards the brokenhearted. And we will always join him there. Yeah. That is why it is okay to not be okay in this place. Because when you come into this place and you're willing to be honest about that and draw near to God, he has drawn near to you, and we want to be near you as well. You do not need to come in here to be ashamed of your pain. You don't need to hide in your brokenness. We want to be near God. I mean, let me ask the question this way. How many of you want to experience God's presence in a powerful way? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Okay. Hey, more hands. I like that. Right. A couple of you are like, I won't raise my hand no matter what you say. Right. Right. How many of you, you, you want to experience God in powerful ways? You want to know his presence in powerful ways? Let me just say this. You want to know God's presence? You want to experience his power? Then go where he is at and he is near the brokenhearted. So when you see somebody who's hurting and you see somebody who is broken, if you get near them, you'll experience God's presence in ways you never, ever had before. You want to feel God's presence? You want to know God's presence? You want to experience God's presence? Get near to what he is near. And the Bible is very, very clear. My God, my King, my Creator, my Lord, my Father is near the brokenhearted. Amen. And that's why we as a church of family get near the brokenhearted. All of us in this room, as we live long enough, will experience trauma in our lives. All of us. I know in my life, I took a little journey recently, looked back to some of the issues of my, my fear of rejection. It started in my childhood as a young boy. My parents, we grew up in a very, 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 very extra kind of legalistic conservative church. Men sat on one side of the church, women sat on the other side of the church. Women wore head coverings. There was no outreach to the community because if you reach out, you may fall off is what they said. And my mom had this powerful experience with the Holy Spirit, and she got all fired up for Jesus and wanted to start helping broken and hurting people. And so all of a sudden, she, my dad came along with this fire that God had put into her heart. And all of a sudden, we were the weird family in the family. You ever been the weird family in your family? We were the holy rollers. We were the, we were the crazy ones. And my mom and dad start, went to another church. And when we did that, because this church was so concerned that if you left that church, you would be excommunicated. And, and, and I won't get into all the details of that, but if some of my family listens back home. But you'd be excommunicated, and when that takes place, when that takes place, family acts different towards you. As all of a sudden, my grandparents and my aunt, some of my some of my some of my aunts and uncles treated us differently. But I, when I was a five-year-old boy, I didn't understand that. I didn't get that. Why grandma and grandpa come to visit and they go to my aunt's house and not come to our house to say hello? I didn't understand that when I was a kid. They had pulled away from us. And then as I got older, I got to junior high, hit puberty, my body kind of went, <laughs> so, How was that again? You want to say that again? Okay. That's all I can say. And then bring it out. And I, 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 I struggled with my weight. I faced lots of rejection, lots of name calling. And so I turned to food more. And so there was more of that. And then as I got older, I went through a divorce. And my first wife left for another man. And there was nothing that burst in my heart like that. Like that pain. And so in my life, I see the pattern of rejection. I, I see some of the things that I've been through. But here's the story that you have probably never heard. I remember the first time I went to church. I, at the time, I was a youth pastor in there. Went to visit another church. My, our, my senior pastor just needed a break and some time to heal. And so I went to visit another church. I think it was two weeks after I found out about the affair. And I'm sitting in worship. I'll never forget this experience. I went and I sat in worship. As I'm sitting in this church, all of a sudden I just broke during worship. And tears started rolling down my face. I mean, you guys see me cry. I get, I get choked up easily. I, I know we all understand that. But I mean, I got really broke to the point where I could feel my body shaking a little bit. And here's what I experienced in that church as I was broken during worship. Here's what I experienced. And no one talked to me. No one talked to me. And as I sat there in my trauma, as I sat there in my rejection and my pain, and I could feel people move away from me, as I sat there in that moment, this is what I said deep in my heart, if I ever get the opportunity to be in full-time ministry again, if I ever get the opportunity to be a senior pastor someday of a church, my church will never pull away from the broken heart. Yes. They will never pull away from the broken I don't ever want anyone to experience this in the house of God. 
it hurt so deep in my heart and added so much to the pain that I was going through. Are we perfect? Can we touch every life? No, but we are looking for the hurting around here, yes? yes. We care about the broken in this house, yes? yes. We move near the brokenhearted, yes? yes? Because that's where God is moving. This is the mission of our church. This is a safe place for the hurting. Which means that sometimes we're gonna be a little messy. Turn your neighbor and go, mm -hmm. Sometimes we're just gonna be a little messy. None of us get through life without trauma. The other day, we had the privilege of going up to Cactus High School and being part of a drama reenactment. What you're about to see is a reenactment of a, of a drunk driver car crash. The entire student body filled the football stadium. And uh, my family was asked to be the, the family in one car, and then there were some high school students in another car. And the whole thing, scene was set up to where there was a, drunk, a teenage drunk driver. He hit another family and one of the members of that family was killed. This cactus went all out. They brought in police cars, like six of them, ambulances. They dropped a helicopter on the football field and took one of the students off in a helicopter. They went all in. Here's, here's, one, here's a couple pictures. Here's the first one. So there, there's the, the white car. We were in the blue van. That's where we were staging. And here's a picture of my, my kids before we, started the, <clears throat> before we started the event. That's what we were doing right there. All right, yeah, and you can see the girl behind them in the car, that she was laying on the hood of the car during the reenactment. And then something happened, and then they staged the scene, and they pulled these curtains so that no one in the, in the football stadium could see us, and they started an audio of the girl on the hood of the car as she was passing from this life to the next. Go to the next picture. And it was in that moment that I got wrecked. All of a sudden, Nicole sitting next to me, take it down, because I don't want, I don't want to trigger anybody. Um, Nicole sitting next to me, she begins to cry, which makes me cry. And they had said to me that the only lines I had in the whole drama was I was supposed to confront the young man in the other car who was a drunk driver and just say, you killed my son. And on the way there, I was praying, because I don't do real good with acting. In the moment, I get choked up, but if, and in the moment, I can be funny. But if you ask me to be funny, I go, bleh, 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 bleh. I, I just, I'm not funny, okay? I'm not. But in the moment, I don't know how to fake that, okay? And so we're there, we're emotional. I prayed, I said, Lord Jesus, touch my heart, help us to be powerful. I hear kids snickering in the, in the audience up on the stand. I hear them snickering because in comes like six police cars and ambulances. It's kind of an overwhelming scene. I get on the ground, they're doing CPR on my son, reenacting the CPR on my son. All of a sudden, I just get overcome. I stand up and I charge towards this young man, and I don't remember everything I said. I'm just, I don't remember everything I said. Something along the lines, you killed my son. Sorry, we'll not bring him back. And I mean, I was fight. My adrenaline was spiked. The officer grabs me, takes me away. And you can hear a pin drop in that room, in that stadium. For the rest of the reenactment. A pin drop. That was a reenactment. Just thinking about that happened. Wrecked me in ways I can't begin to explain to you. But I know this. Some have faced it. Some have faced it. So if that impacts me. Last night I tried to tell the story and I couldn't probably talk when I was crying so hard. Some have faced this for real. Trauma impacts our lives. Impacts our minds. One of the, one of the um, police officers there told me, he said, when we come on a scene like this, we separate families so we can get the story. He said, rarely do their stories ever match because not everybody responds to trauma in the same way. The mind is an amazing instrument created by God. And when it gets fractured, when it gets fractured or broken, sometimes they have to come back to families two or three times over the next couple weeks and they get different stories as they go along because the mind begins to heal itself put itself back together, and God begins to restore order to the mind, and they think clearly, but in the moment, you can't think clearly. There's this, there's this thing called fight, flight, or freeze. You ever heard of it? Mm -hmm. When trauma happens, you have to fight. Something triggers you, it's like it's go time, it's yell time, it's scream time. You know people like this, when life hits them, they hit back. There's reasons for that. There's things they've gone through in their lives. Or, or the whole flight, you know, the trouble comes, boom, they're gone, they're just runners. Or maybe you were married to a runner. Maybe you were friends with a runner. And as soon as life got difficult, pew, they were gone. The other one is more interesting, it's freeze. When trauma strikes, they just go into the fetal position and they shut down. 
with how we talk to him. I don't pray that it messes with that. When difficult things come along, they go into their room, and they're in their room for a long, long time. See, the brain works this way. Put your hand on this way. Okay? The thumb represents your amygdala. The amygdala is where all your emotions are at. This is where we feel. This is where we, we kind of start to um, experience our emotions. Anger, sadness, joy is the amygdala. Put that inside your hand like that. Okay? The rest of these four, I want you to curve them over your thumb like this. And this represents our brain. These four fingers are the cortex that wraps around the amygdala and governs it. How many are glad that we have a cortex that governs our emotions? Can, we thank, can we just say thank you, God, for creating your brain that way? Okay, but here, here's the situation. When trauma strikes, it's all emotion. When trauma strikes, the amygdala takes over. And it's fight, it's flight, or it's freeze. And God's able to restore order. But it's oftentimes in the moment, we get triggered, something happens. And all of a sudden, it's all emotion. You ever been around somebody that's just all emotion? You get upset, you can't reason with them? Did you know that physiologically, in your inner ear, when you get angry, that muscle begins to constrict, and you literally can't hear things clearly? You ever tried to reason with somebody who was mad? Have you ever tried to reason with somebody who was mad? Yeah. Huh? You didn't quite understand what you were saying, and later on they said, well, you said this, this, and this. And you're like, hi, I did not say this, this, and this. Because there's something happened in their brain. They got triggered if you will. As a church, we are imparting truth to people. We're going to bring God's word to them. We want to encourage them. We want to see the broken areas of their life, the bent areas of their life get put straight. We want to bring correction to brokenness in their life. But we have to listen before we begin to correct. Can I get an amen? amen. We need to build relationship, show love, and serve before we begin to correct those broken areas of their lives. That's why we don't say to people, what's wrong with you? We say to people, what happened to you? What have you gone through? What's your story? We're trying to find more and more ways in our church family to hear people's stories. But I'm going to promise you something. It's not going to happen sitting in rows. we got to get in circles so we can see each other face to face. Okay? God, you can't just come in and out and find that hope and healing that you truly long for. We need to be in community with one another. We need to be connected with one another. We need to hear one another's stories. I'll, I'll say it this way. We need to listen first. We need to connect and then correct versus correct and then connect. Okay? In your bulletin, you will find this sheet of paper. I want to warn you. It's called the ACES, your ACES score, finding your ACES score. Everybody take it out. Please. Share with your neighbor. If you have young children with you, there are very, very raw things on this question here. Please do not allow them to read this with you, okay? But I want to show you. I told you I'm going to do something a little different this weekend. I want you to look at this. All right, this is called the ACES score. This was developed by Nadine Harris Burke. She was a pediatrician out of San Francisco, California. This has gone national. This questionnaire is in pediatrician's offices all over the country. And so children, parents answering these questions, uh, foster parents answering these questions, you know, uh, rescue parents are ans answering these questions, and just everyday family members are answering these questions for children ages zero through age 17 in pediatrician's offices all over our country. I want you to look at it. We're going to listen to reading music. I want you to read through it quick, as quick as you can. Do not answer them. Okay, do not, do not answer them. Don't want your brain to there. Some of you don't need to go there this morning, okay? Just look at them for a moment. you need to understand as you look these over today, family. If you have four or more of these, 
I'm not even going to tell you some of the things that many people with more and more things. And I'm not going to speak that over you because we have hope in Christ. Can I get an amen? Yeah. But what I will say to you today is that it may explain, it may explain why some of you do some of the things that you do in some of the ways that you do them. And we're not afraid to look at the brain science and Jesus at the same time because Jesus created the brain. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Okay? And I'm afraid of that. All right? We want to be knowledgeable in the area of trauma. We are a trauma-informed church. But if you have four or more of these, the impact, so many things, it just impacts your life greatly. One of these impacts your life greatly. And what you need to understand, what I want you to hear very, very clearly today, the state of Arizona and this generation that we are raising has the highest ACEs scores in the country. In the country. We are raising one of the most broken generations in the history of mankind. And brokenness Forgets brokenness. That broken generation will one day be the future church in Phoenix. And so we are going to love this generation like never before. We're going to be there for this generation like never before. We're going to reach out to schools like never before. Amen. We're going to spend money in ways we never have before because we want to do what we want to move where God is moving. And God is moving to a broken generation. And we're going to join him in reaching this broken generation. We are not going to be a church that lives for ourselves today. We're going to be a church that one day when I retire in 100 years, when I retire, <laughs> waiting for that. when I retire, we are going to be a church that not only hands off a church that is ready for that generation, but for the generation following them, because a good father prepares for his children's children. Amen. Yeah. We have some of the highest poverty rates among the children in the country. 29% live in poverty. The national average is around 13%. We are 95th in biblical literacy in our nation. San Francisco is 94th. San Francisco knows the Bible better than Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. 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 All right. Only 13% of our city is in church on a given weekend. We live in one of the greatest mission fields in the country. And so this is why we do what we do. This is why we have the passion that we do to reach out to a broken and hurting people. And we need your help. And so Pastor John, would you come for just a moment? I wanted to share for just a moment a way that you can get engaged in helping us be consistent love through more than just one person over time. Dan, one of the great ways that we can pull this entire series together is by you making the decision, now is the time for me to get into community. Or maybe some of you, God is saying, I really want you to take even a step beyond that and start to lead in community. So out on the patio after church, some of the members of our grow team are out there. They're going to partner with you and come alongside of you. And let's figure out together how you can get involved in a life group, a discipleship group, a wellness group, or maybe take that next step into leadership. So stop in the patio, check it out with one of our girl members, and we would love to partner with you in this endeavor. Thanks, Dan. I also want to say to you before we end the series in just a moment, is that if any, if you're going through any difficulty, if you're facing some of that stuff that you read today triggered you, and you're just like, oh my goodness, I've been through these things. What does that mean in my life? We want to be here for you. We want you to email today, wellness at pureheart.org. It's up on the screens right now. Wellness at pureheart.org. Email us, along with one of our counselors, one of our pastors, one of our leaders, be in touch with you as quickly as possible. We don't want you to walk alone. Wellness at pureheart.org. I want to end with this series with this illustration. Um, I was meeting with a counselor friend of mine the other day. He's joining me at Cactus High School on Monday night for our last parent university of the semester. And uh, he donates his time, his family therapist, he donates his time to help parents love their kids. And so we were talking about relationships, we were talking about community, we were talking about relationship with Christ and relationship with one another and how that strengthens our lives. And he said, you know, Dan, I heard this the other day, it's so interesting. He said, there's a difference, he said, it's a difference between a roundabout and an intersection. How many of you know what a roundabout is? How, I hate them. How many hate roundabouts? Can, can we just get it off our chest today? Let's just get that. Now you're raising your hand. Come on, family. Yeah, that's me. I hate a roundabout. We hate roundabouts because they take forever. They seem ridiculous. And you're like, hello, person next to me. I don't know where to go now. Where do I exit? There's like four places to exit here. And you just keep going around and around. Here's the thing about roundabouts. They're like 90% slower than intersections. That's why we hate them. Intersections are fast, like changes, phew, we're through. Phew, 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 phew. It's just, get me where I need to go. Roundabouts are like, where do I get off? This is taking a long time. 
Intersections are 90% faster. But roundabouts have 90% fewer fatalities. In a roundabout, everybody is circling something in the center. We'll call him Jesus. In a roundabout, we go together, side by side. What I want to ask you to do, and it's harder, it's messier, it takes more time. And we don't like taking time sometimes for things that are good for us, but we're taking time for all these other things we think are going to matter. And we don't slow down long enough to be in deep relationship with each other. What I want to ask you to do is get into the roundabout of relationship with Christ and each other. Stop by the tables outside today. Go to our website, look in the area of community and connection and find out how you can get involved and get connected. Maybe you've been through some difficult things in your life and you found healing and you want to help others. We need you to join us to love people. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. I don't want to end the services without giving an opportunity for those who need Jesus. We do this every weekend. Those of you listening online, maybe today for the first time in your life, you can say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Jesus, be the center of everything in my life. Jesus, I need your hope. Your love, your joy, and your peace. I need your power and your forgiveness. If that's you listening online or sitting here in this room, those of you online, there's a button you can click that says, Today I put my trust in Jesus. If you're ready to make that decision, please click that button. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pray with the rest of us here in the auditorium. For the rest of us sitting here today who are ready to say, Jesus, I need you to be Lord of my life. I want to follow you for the first time. Or maybe today there'll be dedication of your life to Jesus. You're not here by chance. We want this moment to bring you back to the safe place to remind you of your love. But that's you today, and you need Christ. And you're ready to make that decision to follow him, to love him, and receive his love. What we do in this safe place is we raise our hand high. So with heads bowed, and you're ready to make that decision without hesitation, we just raise your hand up really high and say, that's me today. I need Christ. Just raise him up or on the room. Just say, I need Jesus today. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Anyone else? I need Jesus today. Pray with me, please. Man, put your hand up. Pray with me. Yes, sir. I see him. Put your hand down. Yes, I see him. Yes, Lord. Put your hand down. Pray with me right now. Say this, Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. Jesus, I trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You know what it is. I give it to you right now. I confess it is wrong. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for loving me and never giving up on me. Now say this, Lord Jesus, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your heart. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God a huge hand. That's awesome. Yeah. If you said yes to Jesus this morning, you just made the greatest decision of your life. And we would love to talk with you about it. One of our team members will be available after service to chat with you. Also, you can text your name to the number that's on the screen. And somebody in, in our, on our teams will get with you uh, during this week. You said yes online. We're so thankful for that today. Also, finally this morning, we will have prayer partners up front. If you want prayer for any reason this morning... Please come and allow us to pray with you. Other than that, have an incredible week. God bless you.